So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. This is Paul the Apostle writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Brother Marco, would you stand and pray for our service, please, sir? Amen. Our title today, Reasons for the Resurrection. Now, we, many people have heard about the resurrection of Jesus. They may not know the word resurrection, but they've heard about Jesus rising from the dead. Many, most people, I would say. And even those who may not know a lot about it, at some point, they've probably heard about it. They may look at it as a fairy tale. And then there are those who are more educated on the matter, who understand why that not only should you believe in the resurrection of Christ, but that you can believe in the resurrection of Christ and even sound intelligent doing it. There's one stereotype that Christians have is that we're idiots and don't can't get through life without some grandpa in the sky to talk to. First of all, God doesn't call himself a grandpa. He calls himself a father. So they're, they're already wrong on that, you know, and. And then the more you listen to people, the more you realize they have no idea what they're talking about and they're afraid to admit it is really what it is. And so reasons for the resurrection. He says here, I delivered unto you. I delivered unto you. That I delivered of you, first of all, that which I also received. And so we see here that Paul received this message from somewhere. Now he says here that he received it from the Scriptures. But he also, we read in the book of Acts, he also uh, received the Word of God from Christ Himself. How that whenever he met the Lord, while Paul, whose former name was Saul, was on his way to Damascus, Syria. Now Paul wrote 14 letters of the New Testament. He wrote more books, but he did not write more words. A little Bible trivia. Luke wrote, wrote more words than Paul, but Paul wrote more books than Luke. And so, but before Paul came to know the Lord, and his name used to be known, used to be Saul, he was not only just someone out there living his life, didn't know the Lord, but he was somebody who would, was actively persecuting Christians. And he would have told you that he knew God because he was a religious leader in the, in the Jewish community. He was what was known as a Pharisee, which was a doctoral level, uh, someone with a doctorate in theology, in ministry and theology. And so the man had a doc, uh, the equivalent of a doctorate degree in theology probably in law also, as you read his writings, you see all of that going on as well. And so, but we're going to say at least one PhD. And so the man was very intelligent. He was very religious. He would even say that when it came to doing the things of God, I was among the chief. I was among the best. I was among those who kept the word of God, not just in church, but also when I went home. Imagine that, right? Being a Christian at home too. He said, I was doing the word of God everywhere. He said, I was blameless in the word of God. I mean, there were times that Paul broke out his credentials. If you got to break out your credentials all the time, he might not be very secure. But he broke out his credentials sometimes because sometimes you got to remind people. And he did. He was telling them, I was one of the chief doctors. I was one of the law. I was one of the chief Pharisees. I wasn't just your general, you know, Got a C and barely got my degree, Pharisee. All right. That kind of runs. There you go. And so, and so he said, I was among the chief. I was at the feet. I was learning from the chief teacher how to be a teacher. And so knowledge was not an issue for Paul or for Saul at that time. And so he was not just persecuting Christians within Israel, 
But he also got authorization letters to go outside of Israel, to go to Syria. Now, why would he go to Syria? Who cares? Because he would say in another place, I got to the point where I was crazy angry against Christians. And I traveled even out to places that were strange to Israel, even out to Syria. So who cares what's outside of Israel? But whenever you're not thinking right, you don't think right. Isn't that profound? <laughs> and he wasn't thinking right. So he felt, man, it is my duty to the Lord to kill Christians. And in the name of Yahweh, I'm going to do that. He didn't know Jesus at the time. In the name of Yahweh, I'm going to do that. Well, the Lord Jesus met him on his way to Syria, to the city of Damascus. Knocked him to the ground and said, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul right there could have been like most people. I'm not persecuting you. I love you. I'm persecuting Christians. But Jesus took it personally. You see, whenever people persecute God's people, God doesn't just sit up in heaven and say, oh, poor little babies. Hey, pobrecitos, little babies. No. Those are my people. Those are my children, right? Any parents in the house that you'd stand up for your kids and become a mama bear, daddy bear in a moment? All right, I own three, you know, three broken arms and five broken legs, whatever. You can't even, you can't, that's not even possible, all right? But you're coming alive, aren't you? All right, hey, God is the same way with his children. The thing about God is he can take people out at any moment. You know, we're not supposed to do that. But he can, he's God. And so, therefore, it's not murder. It's just repositioning someone from one life to another because he can do that with his creation. So even if you tell your kids, I brought you in, I can take you out. No, you can't. <laughs> no, they can't. But you should honor your mother and your father is what the Bible says. And so therefore, he said, I delivered unto you, which I also received. So Saul did not know God. He thought he did, but he didn't. Then he met Jesus. And he didn't come up with 15 excuses as to why he wasn't doing right. Well, my, my grandma, my grandpa, my uncle, my aunt, my cousin. And the, the hypocrites, you know, those are hypocrites, wherever, whoever they are, wherever, every, every church, every church somebody goes to, they're always hypocrites. That's the reason I don't go back, whoever they are, right? They're only there when you're there, but whatever. And so uh, he, he didn't do that. He said, what? What do you want me to do? That's what he said. He said, what will you have me to do? That's a good response to God, church. Lord, what do you want from me? I hear you talking in my heart. Maybe not audibly, shouldn't be audibly. God doesn't speak audibly. He speaks into your heart. He impresses upon your heart uh, convictions. That's how God speaks. So if you're waiting for God to say, this is a sign from heaven, all right? The sign's on the church building. God talks to your heart. That's how God speaks, speaks to you, okay? And so therefore, uh, he didn't come up with reasons. He didn't wait for a sign. He didn't wait for an audible voice. He immediately knew there's something I'm supposed to do for God. So ma'am, if you were created, and all of us were, you were created by God with a purpose. Amen. I'm not saying you know what that purpose is. I'm not saying that you even have to know what that purpose is. I'm just telling you, you got a purpose. For one, it may be teaching children. For another, it may be teaching teenagers. For another, it may be uh, working in a church. For another, it may be to teach men and women in men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies. For another, it may be to take people out on hikes and have Bible studies out on the mountains sometimes. And for another, it may be to just be faithful and support the house of God. For another, it may be to be a pastor. I didn't know I was called to be a pastor till I knew I was called to be a pastor. You had asked me before I was called to be a pastor, I would have told you, well, I don't know. I don't think I want to do that. Matter of fact, when I joined the military, I joined to become a JAG officer. I was joining to become an attorney. That's what I wanted to do. Until God impressed upon my heart the calling to the ministry. Amen. And he still get to deal with all the problems attorneys deal with a lot of times. <laughs> Without all the lying. That's great. All right. So, therefore, that, I didn't say it like, that's not what I said this. I didn't say that. All right. There you go. You, but, you know, God knows who to call. Okay. Because for people who go into the legal field, they need to know how to discern whenever someone's giving them a runaround or giving them a non-answer. As a pastor, you got to be able to know when someone's giving you a non-answer. You know what a non-answer is? A non-answer. That's what it is. And so, therefore, reasons for the resurrection. They give you words, but they don't give you anything substantive because they don't want to be pinned down. That's what a non-answer is. And so, reason number one, there is no salvation without the resurrection. Verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
Now, do people still believe that Jesus never rose from the dead today? Of course they believe that. Same old lies, same old devil, different generation of people. Why would the devil change his lies when it's the people who keep renewing every 60, 70, 80 years or so, whatever? He doesn't need to change his lies. People are people everywhere all the time. Amen? We're all different in our cultures. We got that. We're all different. We respect each other's cultures. If you look around, we're all cultural, multicultural church here because we're all people. We're all created by God and the family of God. Amen. That's what it's about. But cultures are different. They're just different. People are different. But one thing people have in common in every culture, in every country, I've been to a number of countries myself, so with my wife, we all, we've traveled and been around and done things and whatnot. This is our fifth church, so we're not new to the ministry. So one thing we know about all the cultures that all people have in common, they might not like the same food, might not like the same music, might not like the same clothing, but they all have one thing in common, all people do. You know what that is? They're all people. They're all people. Okay, Heads, shoulders, knees and toes, all the rest of it. Okay? They're all people. Sometimes we just complicate things, don't we? We just complicate things. Well, where I'm from, it doesn't matter where we're from. Ultimately, we're people. We got people problems. We got people desires. We got people dreams. We're people. And so with that said, God understands that there are basic needs that only he can meet that he can meet for all people. So one thing I've found in every nation I've been in, serving the Lord and doing things, is that if I can just find out how to get the Word of God to them in a way they understand it and understand their need. Well, that's what God did whenever He sent Jesus. There are people who still believe the same lies today that they did 2,000 years ago on or about when this letter, 1 Corinthians, was written. That Jesus never rose from the dead. That Jesus is still dead. Never found a body. Though they know where the body was buried. We'll get to that in a moment. People know right where it was. And yet they can't find it. And so therefore he says, If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you there is no resurrection? If there be no resurrection, verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Either there is a resurrection or there is no resurrection. And if there is none, we can't say Jesus is alive because he's dead. He's going to tell us in a minute, if Jesus is still dead, you may as well give up the church thing. Who cares? This is what he's going to tell us about in a moment. Verse 14, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is, then is our preaching vain. Your faith is also vain. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, why does he say that? Because Christians are not among the best treated people. Have you ever noticed? Jews and Christians, man. I mean, it's just the two groups that have always been persecuted. I mean, the Jews have been persecuted since the days of Isaac by his older brother Ishmael. And the Christians have been persecuted since the days of Jesus, whenever he came on the scene and started preaching about repentance. And they're both persecuted because the devil knows that the, among the Jews and among the Christians that they have the true God. Christian, Christianity only exists because of the Jews. Okay, We have to remember that. We have our roots in Judaism. The difference is they're still waiting on the Messiah. We know the Messiah has come. They haven't believed that yet. The Bible says there's a veil on their hearts and they will not believe it as a nation. Can Jewish people get saved personally? Of course they can. One of my Bible college teachers was a former Jew. And he's a Christian. He's a seminary teacher. And so they can get saved personally. They call them Messianic Jews now. But as a nation, they're not believing in Jesus because they killed him. And part of their judgment is that their hearts are blind. But yet they're still God's people. Amen. God made a promise to Abraham. Israel is still God's people. I mean, if you just do a little bit of research on Israel, my goodness. I mean, they're the only ones who export water to other countries in the middle of deserts. So they're the only ones that can defend themselves against all these surrounding nations that try to take them out over and over and over and over again. Even though there's 75 peace agreements, they still get attacked. Whatever, all right? I'm just glad to be part of what God's doing. Amen. And so if in this life only, why is it miserable if you believe in Jesus and yet he's dead? Why is that miserable? Because you're going to get persecuted for Christ. People are not going to like you. 
We wish they would like us, but they don't like us. And it's not even you. Jesus said they don't like you because they don't like me. You know, you can be out there clubbing and partying with people like we all used to be before we got saved. Okay, we all came out of something. You can be out there clubbing and partying with them on a Friday night, get saved on a Sunday morning by giving your life to God and just completely handing it over to Him and saying, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be in your house. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be your child. And on Monday morning, when they find out, suddenly they won't like you. You're like, what changed? The God in you changed, amen? The God that used to be in you, Satan, got kicked out by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came in and cleaned up the floor of your house, moved some furniture around by throwing all that moldy furniture out. All right, come on now. Come on, bachelors, got to get rid of that moldy recliner at some point. All right, tossed all that stuff out, brought in some new furniture, holy furniture and took up residence in your heart. So therefore, if there is no resurrection, you cannot be saved. The second reason, we're going to move quickly, we're almost out of time already. Let's talk a little bit here about the proofs of the resurrection. So we're streaming, if you want to go back later and get these references, you can, but I'm not going to slow down too much here. Number one, historical proof. We are told where they laid the body of Jesus. John 19, verses 41 and 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, which is where? Mount Calvary. There was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher or a grave, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation, the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So where did they lay the body of Jesus? In a grave in a garden right near where he got crucified. They knew right where they laid it. Next, they set guards around it. Matthew 27, verses 65 and 66. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went, made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone, setting a watch. Okay, we call that, uh, what do we call that? Uh, what's the army call it? Guard. What's the, the letters? Q C, something like that? What is it? CQ. I got it backwards. All right. I'm in HR, QC. <laughs> All right, CQ. Call it CQ today. But the thing, the difference here was this. Let me ask this real quick. If you're on CQ and somebody walks up to you in your sleep, are you going to hear about it? You should hear about it. If you're falling asleep at your desk, if you're asleep on your desk and you're supposed to be awake, you're supposed to hear about it. I don't know about today's. So I'm just saying you're supposed to hear about it, okay? Now, back in this day, they had four guards at a time for four hours at a time. And that's it. You'd love that one, wouldn't you? Well, you would have it more often, though, because it would be shorter rotations. Four guards, four hours. And yet they were told to tell everybody, oh, we all fell asleep at the same time on our four-hour shift. And the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus. Is that even logical? No. I mean, first of all, they got to unseal a stone, scared little disciples, because they were all afraid. That's why they all forsook Jesus at the crucifixion. You think they're going to cut the seal of the governor? off of the uh, stone and roll that stone away, making all that noise, stone grinding against stone. And those four soldiers, even if they were all asleep, or probably one of them was at least going to wake up and see what's going on. Okay, It's not even logical. But people who don't want to believe the truth will believe illogical untruths or lies. They'll believe illogical stuff. All right, let's look around our world. So they knew where they buried them. They put guards around them, guards that were... Uh, war-hardened guards probably could stay awake for a couple of days at a time rather than just four hours, but they didn't fall asleep. Okay? That, that's a lie they were told to tell everybody. And so therefore, historical proof. We have a record of where the body of Christ was laid. Next, logical proof. If Jesus wasn't alive and the disciples did steal the body, which is unlikely, 10 of the 12 original disciples died painful and agonizing deaths for something that they knew was a lie. That's not logical either. You ever, watch any, you ever watch any of these cop shows on YouTube or whatever? I mean, as soon as boyfriend finds out he's in trouble, he starts ratting his girlfriend out so quick. I can get another one of them, all right? Whatever, right? It's all her fault. Those are her drugs. <laughs> all right, you know what I'm saying? And so, therefore, not my pants, not my feet, not my shoes, not my crotch, not my pants, not my shirt, not my chest, all right? Whatever, all right? It's like they start denying everything over something like a misdemeanor. Do you think that these disciples would have gone all the way to an agonizing death over something they knew was a lie? Probably not. Let's keep moving here. 
One man said, this is reaching back a little bit, but one man said that some highly educated people at the Watergate scandal couldn't hold a lie together for more than three or four weeks. You think these uneducated disciples could hold a lie together for 40 plus years? Probably not. It's illogical. Next, there's witness testimony back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, who was Cephas? Simon Peter. Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. What does the devil tell people? All 500, there's going to be 513 people accounted for here. All 513 people hallucinated at one time about the same person at the same place. Is that logical? No, absolutely not. So therefore, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8, he gives an account of over 513 people. We're not going to go through how, but just take my word for it. 513 people who saw Jesus alive. I told you earlier I was going to be an attorney. If I had 513 witnesses saying the same thing, I would love that. That means I'm going to win because I've got 513 people saying the same stuff. By over 500 people seeing the same person, saying the same things, telling the same story about the person they saw. All right? More than likely true, right? Number three, the final reason for the resurrection. The final reason for the resurrection, which is ultimately the most important reason, is that we may be resurrected. So that we may be resurrected. Now, when I say that we may be resurrected, Pastor Fulmer, I haven't died. Sir, man, the Bible says you're already dead. You're a dead man, dead woman walking. You're on death row already. The moment you're born into this life, you're born into sin. Now, people misunderstand that concept. How can a baby commit sin? I didn't say you're born committing sins. I said you're born into sin. See, the word sin, especially in Romans 6, we're not going there today, but, in, but the word sin is used as a verb, an action, and as a noun, a location. The word sin is not just a verb. It's not just bad stuff people do. It's a location first. A newborn baby doesn't know what sin is, but they're in it. It's called being in the nature of sin. The nature. We're all, we all have a nature. Everyone has two natures. You have your human nature. That's just who you are, the stuff you do as humans. Any humans here today? All right, a couple, right? All right, here we go. And so you do what your human nature drives you to do. Eat, drink, thirst, you know, replicate, in other words, you know, reproduce. We'll use that one. And so then you have either an either a sinful nature or a divine nature. You and I are born with a sinful nature inside of a nature, a location, the nature of sin. That's what it means to be born into sin, not committing sins, into sin. When does a child start actually committing sins? When they know right from wrong and they do the wrong anyway. And then they're held accountable for it when they know what sin is and they do it anyway, okay, whatever that may be. And by the way, a child can understand the difference between sin and righteousness, age 9, age 10, if they're mature. Okay? Sometimes little boys, little girls are mature. They understand things. You hear stories about people wanting to know God, and they can remember wanting to know God when they were 8 years old. All right? Okay? wasn't long after that. God begins to show them truth. And so therefore, uh, so sin begins to get accounted to people when they know that they're they're living in sin, and they must repent and accept Jesus Christ as Savior. That's when the account starts. But they, what drives them to those things is the nature into which they're born. So we understand now, right? And so therefore, you're already dead to God, to righteousness. But thank God that He made a way so that you could be raised from the death of your sin. That's called salvation. Salvation means to be saved. What are you saved from? You've got to be saved from the power of sin in your life. That's what you've got to be saved from. And then after that, you're being sanctified. What does that mean? I go to church. I learn more. I do more. I learn better. I do better. Does that make sense? Okay, God's not going to hold you accountable for something you didn't know. But once you know, then he holds you accountable because the Bible says that he judges based on how much light has been shined into your life. Light is another word used in the Bible for truth. And so for those who reject the truth, 
they're not getting away with anything. They're not getting away. Well, I don't like that. I'm, going to, I'm not going to do it. Fine. I just, I just hand it out there to you. All right. After that, it's vertical. Are you with me? Hey, the teaching is horizontal. The doing is vertical. What does that mean? Between you and God. Between me and God in my own life. So you can have as much God as you want. So forget about hypocrite cousin. Forget about hypocrite uncle. Forget about all them people. You can have as much God as you want. Nobody's holding you back. Amen. And so therefore, you must be resurrected. Another way of saying that, you must be raised from the death of sin. You don't hear a lot about sin nowadays in churches. You hear about prosperity. You hear about health and wealth. And you hear about... uh all these different things that pertain to what we want to do in life. Sir, ma'am, God says in Matthew 6, Jesus does in Matthew 6, he said, God will give you those things. Is there anything with a Christian having money? No. Use it right. Don't let it become an idol. But Solomon was a rich man. Is it okay for a Christian to be smart? You better be smart. The devil's smart. He'll outsmart you if you're not smart. Right? How do you get smart? Learn the word of God. Learn wisdom. And all of your getting, Solomon said, and everything you're getting in life, the career, the money, the possessions, the, the, the degrees, all the things that are fine, he said, make sure you get understanding. There's a lot of people, got a lot of money, got a lot of position, title, rank, and all the rest. They don't understand a lot of things. He said, in all the things you do in life, make sure you understand what's happening, eternally speaking here now. And so therefore, you must be raised from the death of your sin. So if you're not saved, you are dead but you can be made alive. Amen. Just like God the Father made Jesus alive by raising him from the dead, so also by Jesus will he also raise you from the dead. So I'll leave you with this. If I can ask Sister, uh, Sister Perez, or Sister Perez, come prepare to sing, please, Sister. Are there things in your life that you wish you could stop doing and you find no power to stop? You know what that's called? That's called sin. And sin has a control on you. And sin will not release its grip unless it's forced to by Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, you must release your grip of sin and say, Lord, I reject that life and I turn to you. Christianity is not just a belief system. It's an entire life. Now, God has grace. If you don't know a whole lot about how to serve God. God's got grace on that, okay? We don't expect our babies to come out of the womb and run across the room. All right? we, we, we encourage them to walk, encourage them to walk. And then we tell them what? Sit down. You're moving too much. Sit down. All right. But walk when you're a baby. Sit down when you're older. And so quit getting into stuff. And God says, I want to teach you how to walk. I want to teach you how to walk. So you may have served God now 20, 30, 40 years. Amen. Keep walking. Keep learning. Teach others how to walk. But if you don't know God, you need to, you need to accept Jesus. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed the rest of this time together. So let's all bow our heads today. Let's close our eyes.